Good afternoon, Alex. Hello, Rob. How Hello. the devil are you? Nice you. <laughs> very well, thanks. Very well. I'm currently staring out of the window as well while I talk to you. So, okay. Life is good. So I will not read anything like a thousand yard stare if we sort of get into conversation and you look out the window. Knowing no, you, where you live, I, I, can, <clears throat> I can appreciate <laughs> it's a better it usually means there's, um, there's a kestrel or a buzzard just floating over by, so <laughs> just <laughs> catches, catches my eye. Okay, um, well next time I'm in that neck of the woods and you're working from home, I'll come for a coffee. I'm inviting myself, <laughs> you notice how I'm inviting myself here. Please do, please do. Okay. Nice to see you. Well, firstly, thank you for um, agreeing to take part in the Leaders in Tough Times series of interviews. I mean, I know you were very successful with your own agency doing your Nat Chat, so I'm just intrigued to know, and you've got no warning of this question, is what's it like for the interviewer to be interviewed? <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I didn't do many of the interviews for Nat Chat. That was mainly um, Ollie, Jonathan, and Rach, he did those. Um, I just came up with some ideas and introduced them to the people and they, they then went away. Um, but to be honest, I, I've had quite a few bits and pieces of interviews and things along the way, not because I'm some kind of celebrity. It's just I seem to say yes to a lot of things. If someone asks me, I just, oh, yes, I'll do that. Happily. And I seem to like to talk, uh, which is strange because I used to be incredibly shy. So. Uh, it's, it's a strange thing for people who've known me for a long time. Okay, well thanks. Um, Emma, from my perspective, you are, um, you, if I can use the term qualify, I don't mean that in any judgmental way, but you qualify as you're in my network, uh, we've worked together, we kind of know one another. I've seen the kind of rise of your fortune, but the, the, the big thing for me is you're a kind of a, a true wealth creating business that's, that's out there. Um, you've been hit by the pandemic like everybody else, and it's how you've coped. Um, so hence the, 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 the questions I asked in the survey. And you mentioned mm -hmm. about one of them was the unknown in the early days and your responsibility to your teams and your clients. Would you like to just explain a bit more about that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So in the first, I suppose the middle of March, when, uh, or just before lockdown, lockdown was about the 23rd, if I remember rightly. And... Uh, prior to that, they'd been shutting cafes and some of our and, and pubs and leisure businesses. A, f a couple of our clients were well-established um, leisure hospitality businesses, and they had to sort of set, come to us and say, "I'm really sorry, we, we can't do any more work with you. We haven't got any money. We have to close anyway, um, so we have to pull it." And ordinarily, we give people, you know, generally we have kind of a 30-day arrangement if people want to change or or, <coughs> or, or go somewhere else and that's okay but on this occasion we just said that's absolutely fine you know go for it and so we there was a period of maybe two or three days in one week and I remember it very clearly where we a couple of clients um, probably three or four in total decided that they had to stop for one reason or another and at that point we didn't know if that was the house of cards falling down because we didn't have that you know crystal ball to see into the future right now if I'd gone through it knowing where we'd get to now I would have been a lot less concerned about it. But my primary concern at that point was we've spent six years near enough building this business to where it is with a really strong foundation, some brilliant people on the team, and I didn't want to lose them. And I also and I felt, you know, I don't want them to lose their job um, because of something that we can't control. <clears throat> so, you know, our, our concern was how do we make, how do we shore things up to make sure that we, we don't have to lay people off and this was before all the furlough and government support and things like that came to the fore. It was, you know, what are we going to do here? Are we going to, and having been through the financial crash in um, 08, where I was employed by people, but in a, a, a safe business at the time, um, you know, I saw friends working for you know, city law firms going down to three, four days a week, or even five days a week on three or four days pay. And I thought, right, you know, we've got that in our back pocket if things get that bad. Um, and so that was kind of our, our process. And fortunately, my business partner, Rob, um, and my wife, who's also a partner in the business, we all got together very early on, even before that point, and started thinking, right, what's going to happen here if COVID does hit, if, the, if UK businesses have to shut down, how are we going to manage it? So we did have a rough plan in place, but we just did not know what was going to happen. At that point, things looked pretty bleak even though we're in a strong position. Okay, thank you. That was very comprehensive. Um, 
I, right up front, perhaps it would have been helpful for me to give you an opportunity to introduce your business, but we can do that as we go through. So Naps and Right Media Agency. So the, you used the, use the word uncertainty there. Um, how did that uncertainty affect you as a leader? There's always uncertainty in leadership, I think. And all the time that so my um, credentials in leadership came very much from the sporting field where, you know, over years of playing and captaining cricket, hockey, rugby sides um, to varying degrees of success, um, all very, um, very much amateur level. Um, we, uh, we, you know, I sort of picked up from, from coaches and from other people about how you're always learning and how you know things are always going to change you, know, you can pick a team for the weekend and someone will drop out for one reason or another or they won't turn up and you have to you have to be ready to deal with that and so i brought that into the way that we run the business and we're always sort of ready for for anything to happen having said that the the pandemic wasn't really in the category of anything um, until probably mid february late february you know we were still kind of thinking well as long as we don't shake hands and you know, taking the government advice and talking about leadership i'm pretty sure we've been let down by our leaders on a national scale um which hasn't you know hasn't helped us on you know kind of the, the micro level um mm -hmm. leadership stuff but i think the uncertainty really um it helps us sharpen our focus on what we needed to be done and prioritize and i think you know those kind of those those two things we really had to make sure that we were doing the right thing for the business for ourselves and you know the three of us who run the business we have children so we have to make sure that we're looking after our families and everything that's associated with it so it's all about making sure that everybody comes out of this in one piece and that sort of we just didn't know we didn't know how long this was going to go on for and from a personal point of view we didn't know if we were going to get ill you know what would happen in the business if either rob or i who were running it day to day became ill. You know, if I become ill, Louise is going to probably become ill. What's going to happen there? She's a farmer. How's that going to impact? What happens if her parents uh, or her dad who's involved in the farm becomes ill? That's going to take her away, which means I would have more responsibility on the, you know, 100% mm -hmm. responsibility on the childcare side of things. So it's, it's trying to um, map out what, what can happen and all the different um, scenarios, different possible scenarios whilst accepting that we're never going to capture all the scenarios so i think that was that what really got to me and rob was the fact that we just didn't know what was going to happen more than ever before and all the planning that we've been doing in the last because rob only joined us in october we've been planning for you know, 2020 to be a big year and it as it pans out it's actually gone really well um in spite of the, the pandemic and the restrictions on in place because of that so we sort of ridden that uncertainty and come through. Mm -hmm. uh, it, so, so right at the beginning of that piece there, and, and again, that was beautifully comprehensive. Thank you. You brought in sport and, and you said it all be amateur and, and a range of sports. And having had a kind of an amateur sports career, if that's the right word myself, play active sport, you do, you do learn. And, and I think the, the key thing is to keep learning, as you said. So um, you play what's in front of you. It's nil nil when the whistle blows. You don't know that in five minutes somebody's been sent off. And I have in my own uh, time experienced a, a point where, you know, we've been given a, a good grilling at half time by the captain because we're not performing. And we can't use the fact that somebody's been simbined or sent off. You've just got to play with what's in front of you. And that kind of takes into account resilience. And what came through really strongly there for me was, OK, you recognise you don't know what you don't know. But if you start to worry about what you don't know and go down those rabbit holes, you can just you can just implode. So it's mm. about having that resilience and that confidence, I guess, to just go, OK, I get it. OK, I'm going to take a few knocks, maybe. And if that happens, we can do this. But we just got to get on with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really. That, that, that's come through loud and clear. Um, and that, another thing really, that you mentioned. Sorry, go on. I was going to say one thing that we we in looking back, we would do differently is that we we didn't talk to the team. So we have um, four other people in the team who we, um, yeah, we employ, I suppose. We didn't talk to them with any great clarity on 
how close we came to, you know, having to lay people off or put people on reduced hours. Not that it actually, we didn't just, you know, we didn't think we were going to have to do it. It was just sort of, these are the plans. This is what we're going to have to consider. And in hindsight, we probably should have done because at that point, you know, they knew that we were, we were telling them that everything was okay, that we were moving things forward. And we had, you know, we were talking about the forecasts and things. Um, and they knew that we were losing clients because of they were shutting down and they had to. Um, but they also knew that we were retaining clients and actually picking up some new ones along the way. But we still should have, in, in retrospect, said, look, if it gets bad, we, are, we have these options open, we have reduced hours, we have reduced salary and all that kind of stuff. But we didn't do that and we probably should have done. Okay, well, well that, thanks for your honesty. Um, obviously, you know this has been recorded and I know that your team know this anyway. Mm. But, but So what, what you've just described there is just one of the many tight ropes a, a leader in business has to, to, to negotiate. You know, it's a real balancing act. How much do I tell them? Do I overshare and worry people? Do I undershare and get accused of cogging stuff? Um, mm. And I, I guess that nobody's ever going to get that right. You know, it's, it's, it's just the way it is but my instinct would be that i i know that the people that you work with and i know they're not daft and you know what i i think your the, their levels of respect for you and rob would have gone up because they kind of know why you weren't sharing but they also i believe would have the confidence to go to you and ask if they were worried um now that's something which is i pick up in the culture when i visited your business you know it's a bit of jocular a bit of banter but underlying there's that kind of camaraderie, that, that knowing that you can go and, and just have a word. Yeah, I think so. That's a good point. I hadn't really thought about that. We did actually, um, we, wrote, we, we had our year end, end of June, and I wrote them all a letter to explain, you know, what had happened over the last three, three or four months and what the next 12 months looks like, as far as we can see. Um, and, you know, it was full of positivity, but it was also, it was effectively sort of a bit like a parent sitting down with a child saying, you know, this is what could have happened. This is what we planned for. Um, but this is where we are now. And this is what it looks like in the future. And we do, you know, even though we are spread out now over the country, um, because everyone's working from home, you know, we do catch up a lot. We have a lot of video calls, which is a good and a bad thing, but we don't have that, you know, that same kind of um, camaraderie in the office that we, we have had before. And that's, I think that, that means that we haven't been able to just sort of put our arms around people, not physically, obviously, HR guidance, um, but, you know, look after them and, and, and sort of nurture them. Because what we're all about is, is mentoring people to be the best versions of themselves, which sounds so horribly cheesy. Um, but it is what we try to do, because the better they are, the less um, we have to do, you know, being honest. Um, mm -hmm. The more we can focus on running the business than actually doing the stuff. So. Um, but, yeah, but being being away from everybody meant that we couldn't actually do that as well as we, we might want to. Mm. Now that, that that's a great message, that kind of empowerment thing. That that they know that they just know that, that you're there for them, and you know you can put the metaphorical arm around them if need be. And I, I know from history with previous employees you've had how you have supported them through their transition out of your business. So um, one thing which came through from other people in the survey was around the effect of, because they're in lockdown working from home, particularly with younger children, it's the childcare, the schooling. So talk us through Alex's, Alex's version of uh, childcare, homeschooling, and supporting your wife in the demands of her business, please. Well, uh, my wife is a, is a farmer, potato farmer. She runs the farm with her dad and her twin sister, which is, you know, third of a mile from, from our house, I can pretty much see the farm from here. Uh, she also has an accommodation business, which um, despite uh, you know, having to be shut down to leisure guests, was still open to key workers. And because of where we are in Lincolnshire, there are plenty of food sector key workers, the um, people coming off the refineries, the steelworks and that kind of stuff. So there are people staying there all the time, so she's kept busy. But lockdown hit and the kids were taken away from school uh, the day that potato planting started, and potato planting is intense. Um, very long days of, of Louise and her sister sitting on tractors and making decisions and battling against the weather and all that kind of stuff. So that hit, and I, you know, fortunately, uh, because I run a business, I was able to take the, the majority of childcare 
um, from, uh, from the day that the kids were, were, were booted out of school. Um, so we had a sort of a duty to our children at um, near enough eight and six. And so we had a duty to, to reassure them that they were still going to, everything that was okay, even though things were changing, uh, talk to them about what was happening and also explain to them, you know, how we were going to manage it in a way that they would understand. Um, and children always understand more than you expect. I'm fortunate that my mum is a retired teacher, so she gave me some guidance along the way. And actually, uh, after a while, my mum and dad were doing uh, video lessons for the children um, along the way. So balancing all that together, I ended up, you know, I was working in the evenings on a lot of stuff. The team were brilliant because I said to them, you know, Rob and I, we both have children. We're both going to be in and out of the business during the day, but we're still going to get the work done. So you need to rack things up for us to catch up with. We'll tell you when we're online. We'll tell you when we're working. Um, so homeschooling, and again, my mum helped out with this. She said, you don't need to be homeschooling your children. You are not homeschooling them. You are just making sure that they get through. Homeschooling is a conscious choice. You make, you make them, you know, make sure that they do a couple of hours a day of reading and writing, the basic stuff. Um, and they will they will get through to, to September and the teachers will, in her words, sort them out <laughs> when they get back there to school. Um, and again, we're fortunate that our children are relatively bright. So they, you know, they will go away and read themselves and they'll write stories and things like that. So I feel like in many ways, I haven't lived the horrendous um, experience that some parents have. We are we have plenty of room here at home for them to run around inside and outside and they're very adventurous so they go out and about a lot so they've, they've done a lot of discovery on that front but i have had to keep them um pushing on through louise's potato planting lasted about four or five weeks so then she came back and she has been brilliant with allowing me then the time to to get back into the business a lot more so um sort of in spite of everything that's that's been thrown at us we've we have had a relatively not comfortable, but not as difficult as some people would have had period. The business has, uh, it's not so, you know, the agency is not so small that it just got swallowed up with everything. It's not so big that it's got massive overheads, liabilities that would cause it to crumble. <clears throat> We've been supported by the government, you know, the, the 10 grand grant that came through and you know, we took that, you know, rates um the rates relief and um, grant that was helpful but that's you know that gets us through a month but but nothing more um and uh, our landlord uh, i asked for a, a reduction in the rates and he just ignored my, my request which is always very helpful um but uh, but we carry on um and then we hand in our, our notice for the building um so uh yeah it's we've been been pretty pretty good the kids have been good they're, they're absolutely done in now the younger one is back at school he doesn't want to be the older one isn't back at school she does want to be so um yeah, that's not not particularly helpful okay so you mentioned about handing in your notice were we, were you being flippant there or have you actually handed in your notice <laughs> no we haven't yet but it's uh we're we are a very collaborative organization and we try to work together with people all the time um, even if they are deemed as competitors to, to what we do, you know, we would rather just get together and form a bigger unit of, of, of good stuff that we do. Um, and if the person who you know, is our landlord isn't willing to even engage in conversation about stuff, mm. um, we will look for other options. And that's not me being um, well, an arse about it. It's just, you know, we're not that, it's not ideal as a, as a building anyway. We, we, no. What intrigues me is, I mean, I don't think you have to have a wonderful foresight to, to look at the potential for um, landlords all over the country now where their tenants are thinking, well, hang on, we've managed the last three months without the office space or we only need half of the office space. So my, my view would be if I was a landlord, I would be being very proactive now and trying to make sure that I still love those customers and I could do the best I could for them. But it's, yeah. that's an interesting thing because I, I've spoken to a couple of people, not just on these uh, um, interviews, uh, where the um, the landlords have either been totally ignorant as uh, and not responded, or or just entrenched. Say, well, we got bills to pay as well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So, so I think that short termism is going to bite them um, somewhere where it hurts soon. But the well, other thing is for yourselves. You know, you're a very technological 
technology based company even so um internet strength permitting <laughs> he said with tongue in cheek having had uh, problems himself um yeah there's no reason why potentially you don't have to have a premises permanently well it's it's there are plenty of people who can run remote businesses with you know, contractors, freelancers, staff dotted all over the place and, and never get together. I'm not really one of those people. I, I quite like to be social. I like to get together with people. And, you know, even if that's just going for a drink after work or something like that, I think that's really important to team bonding. Um, and I don't want to work from home <laughs> for all, for longer than I need to because I live in a house where a lot needs, a lot of work needs to be done. And, while I'm at home, I'm thinking, oh, I should just be painting that. I should just be fixing this. And, and then at some point, we'll have some plasterers coming in. And then, you know, it just, uh, I like that separation. I've been into the office this morning in Brig, and I've, I'd like it. I like going in there, and I like being, you know, feeling like I'm in work mode. Even if it, I suppose even if it came to having a, you know, a garden office down the garden somewhere, that would probably be okay, as long as you had enough space for everybody to come and get together. But it's still not. Still not ideal. And I like being in Brig. I like kind of being part of the business community there. And that's part of one of the things that we want to do as a business. There aren't any other media agencies in Brig. Um, and there is only, you know, there's no one really of note in and around um, the kind of North Links area particularly. So, you know, we feel like we would like to create this hub of creativity where we are employing local people, we're bringing people in from elsewhere. Who, you know, to add to the talent pool, people who've gone off to you know, seek fame and fortune and then move back up to this area in their you know, early 30s to settle down, have a family and things. We want them to bounce back to us. And so we've got all this sort of rich um, pool of talent to, to, to build the agency and, and drive it forward. So we'd like to have that central point where everyone can get together and feel like they are part of the team. It's essentially like playing, but not having a clubhouse. And I played for um, a hockey club for a while and we didn't have a clubhouse and it just meant that there's nowhere that you can call home. There's nowhere that, you know, I don't know, it's just not quite the same sharing with somebody or, you know, going to a pub or whatever it might be. It's you spirit, like to have that. Experience. Spirit of the Barbarians Rugby Football Club, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, Alex. Well, well, there's a couple of things. I mean, we got many things in common, but there's a couple of things which have come through here for me is... Um, you know, you know my views on sort of future talent and bringing them through. You know, I work with the Princess Trust and um, he hearing you talk about, you know, the, the, the business community and things, you're now a kind of a battle-scarred leader. Um, when I first met you, just starting up, etc. So you've come through a, you've come through recession, you've come through COVID-19, and here you are. Um, okay, it may not be as pretty as you'd have predicted in January, but hey, you're still here. You're still... You're still at it so well actually in fairness we're probably um our forecast is probably for 2020 to be a better year than we had forecast at the beginning of the year and whether that's just because we've grown more and just had a bit of, but anyway yeah so it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, actually, it's that kind of you've had a man sent off syndrome you're working a yeah. bit harder maybe yeah that's okay it. so what 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 advice would you give uh, as that that kind of business character i've just given you know that kind of scarred leader if you like what advice would you give to aspirant leaders, the younger people coming through in business, um, to help them cope with adversity? The, the one thing that I've been, I've tried to do right from the beginning is to get on with everyone and, and be nice to them, and, um, not in a sort of a sickly way, but just to, you know, to understand what their challenges are and just to, you know, to, to try and help out and, and if you if you do that if you help other people generally they will end up helping you in one way shape or form and i don't do it in order to get help from somebody else and and that applies to everybody so you know we get a lot of work through people referring um, businesses into us we've get we've picked up a couple of employees through somebody saying oh you should go and work for for them or at least you know send your cv in or, or get in touch um and that to me that's that's really interesting um it, it shows that people are willing to or they, they buy into what, what you're doing so i think that the the thing that, that i would always be proud of is having built that respect um or not knowing if people don't disrespect me i don't know <laughs> or don't not respect me maybe they hide it well um but i think the if you can if you can look after everybody 
and sort of put your arm around everyone and understand what, what makes them tick, you can find the right solution for them. And that comes in marketing, that comes in you know, employing people, it comes in, in leading people. Again, in, in the world of sport, it's, it's understanding what people are good at and why there are 15 positions on a rugby field because basically there are 15 different shapes of human and they all fit in to make one amazing team um, and to, to move it all forwards. And that's, that's the same in business as well. You know, you get the mix of introverts and extroverts, you get the mix of you know, creatives and geeks and then you get some you know, creative geeks and you, you grab hold of them and you don't let them go. Um, and you, you, you build everybody together. And I think that once you've got that solid base, once you've, you've done some really good work for people um, and you thank them for it and you, know, you, you remain humble, you don't just spurt a load of crud all the time, you, you know, people get to know you. And when challenges come your way, actually you can deal, and deal with them because you've got a support network and you've got people who are looking out for you. And even if that's you know, people who will you know, help you out if you need some work doing really quickly and they'll put you to the front of the queue, or it's somebody who'll actually say, actually, yeah, yeah you, know, you, you want someone who you know, you maybe you want to build a, an e-commerce site or something and have a, have a bash at that. You know, here you go, speak to my friend and, and they'll, uh, they'll help you out with it. So it's, it's making sure that everything that you have done has a purpose and, and reflects who you are. Anybody who knows me through work will know me in a social situation as well. There isn't a work me and a social me and I try to get that across to the rest of the team. Yes, I want them to, when they come through the door to, the, to work, whether that's the actual door or the virtual door, they've got to take a deep breath and, and play the role of whatever role it is they have in the team. Mm. Um, but I want them to be them. And if you, you know, often on LinkedIn, I'll be slightly mischievous because that's just who I am. Uh, you're not going to see me, hopefully, um, putting kind of uh, things that lack humility on there or you know, criticize other people without any great reason. It's always sort of constructive, you know, have you thought about doing it a different way kind of thing. And I think as long as you, you do that, then you're going to end up working with the right the same people. There are lots of other, you know, lots of other styles of leadership out there. You know, people basically like, you know, the cotton mill type <laughs> leadership. Um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's not really my thing because I'm a bit more of a people pleaser than I am a, um, I suppose, your, your style, your style is actually suited, in my in my opinion, and I base this on lots of anecdotal evidence and a little bit of research. I mean, there is a lot more research out there, I guess, to support this, but it's it, it's that style is suitable for managing people in the twenty first century because the new entrants to the workplace have a completely different take to even yourself and certainly to myself when I joined the workplace, um, it, it's almost a kind of a, a massive spectrum now mm -hmm. of attitudes, behaviours, expectations. So what you described to me is I would summarise as the coaching approach to leadership or leadership through coaching. Um, and if you can engender that in your business, the people who you are now coaching will become coaches. Um, I, I can't remember who said it, but uh, years ago, leaders used to be marked by how many followers they had. Now great leaders will be marked by how many leaders they create. So, so yeah. this is what I'm kind of hearing, you know, what you're doing in your business. Okay, I'm, I'm, sorry, go on. It is interesting because, you know, 2008, I started working at Facebook and the, the, the attitude they had there was build a team of people who would get on, who would understand the common goal and would work towards that as long as they had vaguely the skills needed to do the technical side of the job. Uh, and then they just teach you how to do that stuff if you didn't know it. And, and I sort of tried to bring that through. And I was amazed when I moved uh, out back up to Lincolnshire in 2014, 2013, and came across some businesses where they were still saying, you clock in at this time, you clock out at that time, you, you know, you'll do what I tell you to do. You know, there was no kind of, um, I suppose, team, ethos and then you know a couple of years later people were sort of saying well look we're, we're doing this for the team we're doing you think that you're way behind and i wonder if that's the case across all you know kind of non-city locations whether that mm. makes it sound like a bit of a um yeah. uh, of an idiot but i just i just feel like that stuff is gradually permeating through and hopefully it will go into those organizations where it's unexpected mm. 
if I refer us back to an earlier comment you made um, about you know your your um, take on how you're managing people remotely and how you prefer to be with them, um, imagine the challenges presented by those people that you just described most recently about you know in terms of the clocking in, clocking out. I'm sure it goes all over the country. I've actually seen evidence of it. That kind of macho, I need to be in control, my ego, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What am I going to do? I can't see them. Now, clearly, there are some businesses where it's important that people are sat at a machine. You know, you can't virtually um, bend metal from your kitchen. You know, when you use the hand presses, etc. So we, under we, we understand all that. But from the leadership perspective, it must be very challenging for leaders of those types of businesses. Okay, I'm, I'm very mindful of time, Alex. I'm mindful that you're a busy man. And thank you very much for your time. Just to remind you that prior to putting this out anywhere on any kind of a uh, social media or LinkedIn or wherever I'm going to put it, um, I will send you a copy for you to, to give me the explicit yay or nay over it. So you've got the final sure. say. And um, you agreed, obviously, well, to have... Well, what I would say is I'd refer you to the fact that I am who I am and generally things that I say, I believe, and yeah. I'm happy for them to okay. go out. No, that, that's cool. But, but I, it's, and then it's part of me just saying to you, you know, you've got the control here um and you would obviously agree to uh, some of some of the quotes so um t tell louise i still love chip so all the hard work is not lost on me um i love the fact your mum's a teacher and and how you kind of very carefully influenced her to take on your children's education very smart <laughs> oh damn that's going live okay <laughs> Thanks again, Alex. So um, I'm going to cut the recording now and uh, I'll speak to you soon. All right. Cheers, Rob. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.